Welcome to Say More from Boston Globe Opinion. I'm Shirley Leung. Okay, I've got a fun conversation for you today. My guest is someone I've known for more than two decades because we're both columnists here at The Globe. Meredith Goldstein writes the paper's Love Letters column, and she hosts a podcast with the same name. For close to 15 years, Meredith has answered hundreds of readers' questions about love, dating, and relationships. I asked Meredith on the show because I wanted to know what is dishing out all that advice taught her about relationships, and who is she dating? Inquiring minds want to know. Along the way, we got into why so many people read advice columns, even if they don't readily admit it. And we discussed the hidden ghost character in every relationship. Here's my conversation with Meredith Goldstein. Hi, Meredith. Hi there, Shirley. We have known each other for too long. We're like the old ladies at the Globe now, right? It is funny because when I started at the Globe and I was in my 20s and got into my late 20s, there were these middle-aged women who looked annoyed all the time. Like they were really talented and they were good mentors and... But they That's looked us like now. That's well, us, right. right? I mean, there was a meeting recently where I was like, "Oh, I'm the middle-aged woman rolling her eyes in the back of the meeting," and I was so proud of myself. And I, it was like really a circle of life moment. So yeah, I have been blessed, especially in a field like journalism, to age into this role. So Meredith, let's start talking about your career. So when you first got started in journalism, was it your goal to grow up to be? a relationship advice columnist? No. I mean, unless you've got it in the family, I don't think that's something anybody really thinks about doing. But I grew up with musician parents. So my late mother was a pianist and a teacher. Both of my parents went to Juilliard. So when I got into writing, my first hope was to be a music critic or a music writer because I thought, well, I didn't know that. I'm like not a bad musician, but when you have two parents who went to Juilliard, you're like, oh, I'm I'm not good like that good. So wait, do you play an instrument? I can play the piano pretty well for someone who doesn't work at it. And I was oh, always wow. cheating, you know, like I was good enough to not try that hard. But even with a natural talent, you have to try very hard to make it a profession. So and I didn't like it that much. I love music, but I, I didn't like music as a profession. So I thought, okay, I love the idea of journalism. I love talking to people. I love highlighting the work of people who are interesting. You know, I I went into news training at that point because that's what you did. And I really got a great basis in covering a meeting and, and understanding, you know, public service journalism. I don't even know if we called it that at that point. And then I thought, now is my time. I'm going to be a really great rock critic someday. And Sarah Rodman formerly of the Boston Globe, who went to Entertainment Weekly and the LA Times, she did a wonderful thing. And she took me to what I believe was a white zombie concert. And this is a band that I was not interested in. And whether it was her point or not, she was basically like, if you're a music critic or a music writer, you have to write about this too. You can't just write about the boy bands you like. You can't just write about the pop music you like. You have to consider music as a whole. So I realized pretty quickly That wasn't it. It's work. Yeah, it it is also evaluating and becoming part of things you don't want to listen to. So what I then realized was the stories that I liked most were about people and their relationships. And that's how you become an advice columnist. So are you an advice giver by nature? (laughs) I think I'm a listener by nature. I hope. I hope that's what I strive to be. I think I am a person who reserves judgment. I'm not the kind of friend who's going to yell at you about stuff. I don't believe that that's the best way to give advice, to tell somebody they're doing it wrong or here's what you do. I think life is super messy and things start and end and we're just constantly course correcting and making different choices along the way. So I think for a long time, I've certainly been a friend you can come to and say, hey, I have all these weird thoughts about what I'm doing and I'm not going to make you feel terrible about yourself. And if I do, then you really screwed up. So the Globe's a big newspaper. I mean, we cover politics, business, sports, the environment. With everything going on in the world right now, it's the love letters column that consistently does well with readers. I mean, it's every time you post something, it always pops up to the most read list on our website. Why do you think your advice column has such an appeal to readers? And who are your readers? Well, so advice columns have always had appeal. And 
some more than others, some at different times. Some of it is escapism. So if you look at the front page of the Globe's website and you're slapped in the face by a bunch of headlines that make you feel terrible about everything, and then you see a headline that says, like, is this dude going to ask me out? The stakes suddenly maybe seem smaller, right? Like, this is something that I can manage to get my head around. It's one person's problem about dating. And sometimes it's fun to read. A lot of the time it's fun to read. And you also have that feeling of... It's very fun to read. (laughs) You also have that feeling of like, wow, this is a problem. And it's not my problem. Right. (laughs) So there, there is that piece of it of just like, to some people, they'll say it feels like a break from all of this. So I think that plays into its popularity. I do think that on the other side of this, there's popularity because it's a decoding of what's happening in the world. So you consider politics, economy... All of these things that play into how we live every day and how our lives change in these subtle ways. And what do you get? Well, you've got people who are writing into me to say they cannot afford to not live with their partner, that perhaps they're moving in too quickly because rent prices are so high. You get more letters about polyamory because people are seeking new structures for relationships that are less limiting. You get divorces after a pandemic. You get letters about seizing the day because of the pandemic. So I think when we ask these big questions about like, well, what do all of these big things mean for us? Climate change, like, you know, the fact that inflation is what it is. Well, we can see what they're doing to our actual homes, our brains in these tiny questions that might seem like fluffy escapist things, but are actually really part of a moment. I mean, I always say some of my letters could be written at any era And if you go back and you read like the early Jewish advice columns and like Yiddish newspapers, Hmm. a lot of them are just these evergreen, this man liked me and now I can't find him. I mean, there was there was there was ghosting (laughs) many, many generations ago. But then others are really of a moment. And those are the ones where I think advice columns can be such a great snapshot of history. Do you think your readers are mostly single? No, they are all over the map because, first of all, I don't know that single people want to read about the woes of being single all the time. I think for a lot of people, they're trying to figure out, well, what are the lives of my friends like? What are the lives of my children like? They are absolutely Mm. trying to say, wow, isn't it great I've met someone? I think anyone interested in the life of another human is a good reader of this. But I think there's such like a weird misogyny about caring about feelings and relationships is like not okay if you're like a straight dude. And that is changing. That is changing. But I think it's a generational change. I think it changes over time. And I will be excited when there's a day when somebody says, of course, I read your column. And I'm a straight man who is 65. It makes perfect sense that I do. So when your readers write in about once a month, when I read your column, I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe that person just wrote in about something so intimate and such an important question about their life, right? And so why do you think so many people are willing to ask for advice in such a public forum? Well, to some extent, it's not fully public because they are anonymous. Right. But still. Yeah, but (laughs) they might be more willing to tell me something than tell their own partner. I think the stakes feel high, but a little bit lower. So it's like a test run. Sometimes I feel like I'm getting the test run for the real conversation that's going to happen with a person who's actually in their life. And I'm happy to be that test run. I'm happy to be a workshopping area. So what's the most, uh, I don't know, intimate or creepy or whatever, I don't know, bizarre request, I guess, question that you've gotten recently? I can't say that any of it is bizarre to me anymore because like, what is bizarre, right? Like, I mean, it's like... (laughs) That's true. I know. You've seen it all. (laughs) I I have, and and it's so... um, We all look bizarre to somebody else. So I think, you know, some questions are questions I would never have and never need to ask. Like, that's what's bizarre to me. And, And this isn't a judgment as much as just the reality is that... Some people write in asking if it's okay that they feel a certain way. Right, yes. That's, like, yeah. I want to end my relationship, but I'm being told by the media, society, my Instagram accounts that this isn't a good idea. Am I allowed to feel like yeah. I know better? And, you know, I get a lot of questions about, is this yeah. cheating, you know, within a relationship? And I'm like, cheating is whatever you decide that it is, you know, like every committed couple has different rules about what counts. Like we have politicians who would have you believe that having lunch with someone 
could be cheating. So I, you know, you got to figure this out. So I, I think that that's what is bizarre and probably like a symptom of the way we live is like, am I okay to do what I want? Is there any advice you later regretted giving? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to to point to exact pieces of advice. I think in my effort to be non-judgmental, I am probably much more like, well, what do you think about divorces and relationship endings? I've learned to be a little bit more aggressive about that because what I've been told by people is that sometimes when I tell them, oh, you know, maybe this could work itself out, even giving the wrong advice, they are that much more sure mm. about the right advice. So they will say like, yeah. oh, well, I actually reading that made me frustrated with you that you didn't tell me to get a divorce and I knew I needed a divorce. So that that's like a bonus too is like, it's not like anybody reads my advice and then just does whatever I say. They interpret it, they decide whether I'm right, and it gives them another tool for like coming to their own conclusion. More of my conversation with Meredith Goldstein after this short break. So you just wrapped the eighth season of your podcast, uh, also called Love Letters. So congratulations. Thank you. This season's theme was on money a topic near and dear to my heart. I've been a business journalist for more than two decades. But um, in the podcast, this season's podcast, you talk about money as, quote unquote, the invisible ghost character in every relationship story. Unpack that a little bit for me. So usually we have themes in our seasons like breakups, how to meet somebody, you know, how do you know? We had one about lessons you learn at different ages about love. But I am also interested in money as a journalist and as a human, right? And I think as you get older, especially, you're like, oh, what I have or what I do not have has informed my choices, my philosophies, my companions. And they were all these episodes of the podcast where I was like, huh, well, we never really mentioned that this lovely older couple met in their 80s and fell madly in love. We, we never mentioned that they were able to do that because they have the means to fly to see each other. You know, that was one of the more romantic stories we told in season seven about two people in their 80s who fall madly in love, start flying to each other, completely change their lives to start something new at a later part of their life. Well, it is very clear throughout the episode that they can afford to do this. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just true. And when we talk about geography in another episode, it's like, well, where do I want to live? If I was living in a different city, would I be having a more successful dating life? implied in that is that some cities are more affordable than others. So I really did feel like every episode we've ever done kind of has a lot to do with money. We have a matchmaking episode. Is it worth hiring? I mean, that's pretty, you know, apples to apples. Like, if you spend money, will you get something in return? So I really just wanted to say, hey, instead of this being this like minor character or the ghost character, the invisible character, let's look at it through that lens. And I will say that this was a really weird season in that as soon as we announced it and we invited people to submit their stories, I had a lot of friends text me and say, I'm so glad you're doing this this season. Boy, do I have some stories for you. I would never tell them. I learned and have learned that people are much more willing to talk about cheating, sadness about being single, you know, all of these embarrassing dating stories. They'd rather tell that than talk about their financial situation. And in your first episode, you had a married couple, right? Yes, a married couple. What what I love about this married couple who came forward to talk about... The hidden debt. The hidden debt of one partner is that two-thirds of the way through the episode, they also reveal they are in an open marriage. They negotiate the terms of their very committed open marriage. This is not easy to talk about. Coming up with boundaries and rules and ways to consent and how to have these conversations... A lot of grown-ups can't have these conversations. It's not always easy. Meanwhile, that came pretty naturally to them. The talking about the credit card debt was harder. So that is, I think, really what I've learned is that we are challenged when we're in relationships with so many things. Like, you can speak to this. I, I am childless. But, like, you know, I assume that when people have kids they're and, and their partner, they're like, oh, you want to do this a little bit differently than I do. You know, you have to, like, combine all of these philosophies that don't, come together that quickly and easily. And yet to be partnered with children is to have to negotiate a lot and compromise a lot. 
where does money fall in the conversation for you? Is it one of the easier things to talk about or harder? Oh, no, it's a huge stress uh, in a marriage, uh, especially in a high cost state like Massachusetts. You know, I mean, we are probably the epitome of, you know, middle class to upper middle class. Yet <laughs> our mortgage is gigantic. Our child care costs were huge. And now everything is expensive. You know, we're, we're painting the house now. And, you know, just to give you a sense, you know, the estimate was $10,000. And that was a relief. To pay. <laughs> I thought it would be closer to $20,000 to paint the house. And so it's just really expensive. And don't get us started about saving for college. I mean, you're right. Kids are a huge stress. I always tell my friends who don't have kids, you don't have to worry. <laughs> when financial planners talk about you need to save for college, save or retirement, it's because you have kids. They create all this debt. and <laughs> It is true, but... So you don't have to worry as much if you don't have kids. I mean, yes, you, you have to save, you have to watch your know, budget, but it's not the same when you have kids. I've thought about this a lot. I ask this question so much of myself, like, why am I not super like rolling in it? Because I don't have kids, right? But you know, I've also spent most of my life unpartnered. I've never lived with a romantic partner. So there's also that shouldering. You're it. I'm not splitting things. Right. You're splitting things. But that's nothing compared to a kid. So I want to talk about one of the episodes that I thought was really interesting that kids today, now I do sound like a, a true middle-aged mom now, kids today that when they go on a date, the guy still picks up the bill. That shocked me that the guy still picks up the bill most of the time. Yeah, so this was a bummer lesson, which is that we decided to do an episode about two Gen Z people, and the people we talked to were straight. We knew that they were not representative of all, you know, Gen Z people. We just wanted a snapshot. And I thought it was important, actually, to talk to straight people because I kind of wanted to know, well, like, what gets stuck, what what's left behind? And they kind of know, Right. And it was interesting that one person, the woman lives in more the Chicago area, the man lives in the DC area. Both of them talk about the astronomical cost of dating. You go out for two drinks in DC, you're basically out potentially more than 100 bucks. Both of them said the man usually pays on a straight person date. These are people in their mid 20s. I thought that would have gone away. I thought it was already going away. I thought Venmo culture. That's what I thought. Yeah. I thought, you know, with Venmo also, it's really easy to just say, hey, like, let me, you know, the woman we talked to, Jackie, she talks a lot about how, of course, she offers. It's not that she's not offering. She does have her own expenses, though, that I think is really worth noting. Because I said, if you're not paying for some of these dates, what are you paying for? And there's, first of all, like a beauty self-care oh, standard for that's, oh, that's interesting, straight women right? that okay, is, you know. All right. Okay. Like, I told her to send me receipts for anything that could be date related. Oh. Parking. Right. You know, because of where she lives and commuting in, right? A lot of parking expenses, yeah. nails, oh. the membership of the dating site. Now, for Nick, who we spoke with, like who was our straight guy who's paying for a lot, his expenses were certainly bigger. He also was dating more. Right. Well, he was the guy who was almost one one week, right? He was like, I need to get to 50 in a year. Right. You know, he's really doing this as a right yeah. activity of like, he wants to meet somebody, but he's also like, let me have a bunch of experiences. And yeah. both of them, by the end, we were talking about 2020 and how awful it was, but also for those who continue to date. And if the weather was good, they took a walk. Right. And if we all learned anything. It, it doesn't have to cost money. No, and there's so many great, I mean, so many, so many great ways to right. do a date. And we just had a an episode with two people on our business staff where one young person says, like, go to the library and pick out books for each other. And I was like, that oh. is free oh. and amazing. And what a character reveal of someone. So I was thinking when I listened to that episode, I was thinking, I wanted to know what do gay couples do? They do whatever they want. The, the way that, you know, straight, and I say this as a straight cis woman, it always like years after the gay community figures out a thing, I feel like my straight friends are like, oh, we could do it that way too, right? Like so much of, of what I see in long-term relationships now about having different boundaries with open relationships and how this makes their relationships last longer. It's not for everybody, but it is for a lot of people and more than you probably know. Like these are all 
ideas borrowed from a community. And with paying, too, it's like, well, why would anybody in particular pay? I think you said in the episode, uh, the bill should be split. I think that's what you do, right? Just just split the bill as as much as you can. I think especially on a first date, like my sister and I are both people who believe, even with each other, that we like to treat and we like to be treated, too. So if you're in like a relationship that is making it past the second date, like your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn, I think is fine. Also, if somebody makes a lot more money, like if you're if you make four times what your partner makes, like pick up some food, dude. But I think contribution can happen in other ways. Is someone always planning the date? Does it take them time? Are they driving farther to get there? Like there's so much that plays into it. But I think be generous to the extent that you can be without it being unwise. If everybody does that, we're in good shape. What was your favorite episode from this season? I think there's a tie. One is a couple that has a prenup. And I think throughout my whole life as an advice columnist and before that, prenups were like, oh, well, you know it's going to end, right? Or just a smart thing to do. Like, but there's like a, I don't know, it's got, there's a stigma with it. I'm like, what does it mean, right? Especially if you're not coming from some generational wealth that you have to protect. Like, why am I doing this? This couple makes a prenup seem like the most romantic thing you could possibly do. So I highly recommend that episode. Wow. But also just for timeliness, I talked to two people who were in the writer's strike together. We're not only striking together, but are writing partners. And I think it was really relatable to me because, you know, we know a ton of journalists who are married, yeah. people at the Globe who are married. So they're like double. Yeah, I married a journalist who's now. I have dated journalists before and people in the industry, and it brings up all sorts of other complications. But there's also this beautiful thing of somebody knowing the shorthand of what you experience every day. The other side of that is if you're like two artists, right, who don't make much money, or if you're in the travel industry and it shuts down because of a pandemic, both people are affected. So I loved talking to these two writers because they're both on strike they're coupled, they're writing partners. It's like they have put all of their eggs in one basket. And that's a lot of couples out there. So that was really interesting too. the finances of coupling up with someone who loves what you do and does what you do. I mean, there are a lot of doctors who are married to it, lawyers, journalists, I mean, teachers, right? Yes. There's, a, there's a lot of that going on because you tend to meet your significant other, right? It, at work. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and you share, you might share some values. So it it happens all the time, but we don't always talk about it. You spent close to 15 years giving relationship advice to others. So what about your own love life, Meredith? It's interesting. For so many years of this column, I was very happy to be a voyeur. And I think that's been a lot of my life. I think what I'm trying to figure out in my mid-40s is how can you find what you want and experience what you want without falling into the traps, right? Of Especially as a woman, and I say this as like a straight woman in the world, it can be really complicated, right? Like I look at the business of marriage and what it has meant, and I don't know if it's for me, but does that mean I don't like it? No. It Does it mean that I can't have something that is more tailored to the lifestyle I want to live? Sure. So, you know, I am with someone now, and I think it's constantly asking, well, you know, it's newer also. So it's like, I'm enjoying this incredible beginning, right? What we're at my age, so many of my friends are like, well, I've been looking at this person for 18 years or 15 years. I'm we are not sick of looking at each other, which is like a really nice thing. But I've been trying to like wipe the whole thing clean and start with an empty marker board and say, what would I put on it? What does a relationship look like to me? How much of it is about partnership and finances? How much of it is about partnership with family? How much of it is just watching TV and eating kettle corn, which for me is like a number one pillar of like, why to have a relationship? It's like, you know, someone who will like sleep over after you eat the kettle corn and watch TV. So like, what are the things? Because when I started dating him, my life was full. It never felt like there was like a void of, oh, this is where a partner goes and I'm missing a thing. So if you're not missing anything, It puts a lot of pressure on the relationship for the relationship to be additive. And I know it can't be additive all the time, but like if I could draw something new from the beginning, what would it look like? Because I'm trying to figure this out of like, you know, I have a sister who's basically my wife. She always says like, oh, we're sister wives. And I'm like, that's not what that means. (laughs) Not what that means. But, But she and I have, despite her 
you know, being in her own romantic partnerships, like she and I have always operated from the time we were, you know, pretty young to, well, she's the person I call. I'm the person she calls. We are Grey Gardens. We are the primary partnership. So then what? What room is left for the romantic relationship? Does the, my relationship with my sister have to change? Like, does it mean that there's more room for just straight up joy with the romantic partner? Because it's not about like chores and sharing expenses. I don't know. It's, it's a... A complicated question I'm, I'm dealing with every day. Well, Meredith, this has been a great conversation. We don't get to do this very often. We're so busy. What a pleasure to sit down with someone and just, you know, gossip for a bit. Today's episode was produced by Daniel Ackerman with help from Scott Hellman and Abby Kamina. Our engineer is Ariana Martinez. Our editor is Jim Dow. Our music is from APM Music. If you like the show, please leave a review and follow us on Apple, Spotify, and wherever you find your podcasts. Find us online at globe.com slash opinion. This is the thing. I don't think it is unusual. What is unusual is... I'm sorry, there's a big bug on my floor. That's what I'm looking at. Hold on. Oh, is it dead? Yeah, the murder. murder? Uh, Yeah, I heard the murder. Um, It better be dead. And it's under a Goonies board game. So like, it's all very creepy. I'm Shirley Leung. Thanks for listening.